Welcome back to Statistical Methods. This is week 11, lecture two, where I will begin to discuss correlation. So some announcements. Homework five goes live on my stat lab today, November 4th, November 4th, and is due Wednesday, November 11th at 11.59 p.m. And also quiz two goes live Monday, uh, November 9th, and is due Friday, November 13th at 11.59 p.m. So to this point, the types of studies we've learned to analyze have exclusively been the following format. We have an independent variable, which is a categorical variable, and a dependent variable, which is an equal interval variable, or an ordinal variable that is treated as equal interval. So we focused on comparing measurements from different groups based on a qualitative, non-numeric dimension of took a vitamin versus those who did not take a vitamin, people who work at different companies, like Orange Inc. versus Pear Inc. Um, and jurors who deliberated alone versus in a group. Or people who encoded words in different ways. In self versus pleasant versus survival. Um, Q conditions. Um, a situation we haven't yet discussed is when the independent variable is an equal interval variable as opposed to a categorical variable. So remember, equal interval variables are numeric variables where intervals between values are equivalent and consistent across the full measurement scale. So the difference between a one and a two is the same um, amount as the difference between a 100 and a 101. For example, yearly income, age, IQ, SAT score, or various personality trait measurements. Clearly, there are variables of interest to social scientists who may want to examine relationships between variables like these and other equal interval variables. Generally, these research questions take the form of, what is the strength and direction of the relationship between these variables? Or put another way, to what degree can I predict someone's score on variable Y if I know their score on variable X? Analyses for quantifying equal interval um, and equal interval relationships require a different approach from what we've learned thus far. To use the methods we used before, we would have to create groups at different cutoff points along the range of possible values, which would re rely upon several arbitrary decisions. How many groups do I create? And what do these groups represent? What cutoff points should be used for establishing these groups? What about the variability that exists within each of these groups? The results of these analyses would thus rely on how we create such arbitrary groupings, something we can't, uh, we clearly want to avoid. Fortunately, there are some more direct approaches for quantifying equal interval, equal interval relationships that we'll begin to learn today. First, we'll discuss the tool um, used to visualize the relationship between two equal interval variables, a scatter plot. The scatter plot is made up of a series of points with each point representing two measurements taken from one individual. We'll communicate both measurements in a single point by placing it at the appropriate point along both the X variable one and Y variable two axes. So here's a scatter plot of height and weight. You can see a general trend here that larger heights are associated with larger weights. So here are the steps to make a scatter plot. First, you draw the axes, placing your two variables of interest on these axes. Second, you label these axes with the appropriate range of values, capturing any possible score you might find on each of these variables. Step three is to mark points for each individual communicating their score on both variables, along both axes. So note that it doesn't matter which variable goes on which axis, the variables conceptualize as predictors or causes usually go on the x-axis with outcome variables on the y-axis. But keep in mind, this doesn't imply cause and effect. It's simply a relationship. So for example, this point here represents one participant who slept six hours last night. So here's the hours slept variable. 
and it winds up with six, and whose mood or happy mood score is a two. So read down this way to find out the score on this variable and read across this way to find the score on this variable. Now this point represents one participant who slept eight hours last night and whose happy mood score is seven. So what does the scatter plot tell us? Points roughly follow a linear pattern here, communicating the strength of the relationship between our variables. Points go up uh, from left to right here, communicating direction of the relationship between the variables. So the interpretation is that there does seem to exist some kind of relationship between hours of sleep and mood. Specifically, as hours of sleep increase, happy mood tends to increase as well. Thus, I have some power to predict a person's mood based on their hours of sleep the night before. The statistical procedure used to quantify the strength and direction of a relationship between two equal interval variables is called a correlation. The key statistic we'll rely upon here is the correlation coefficient, denoted as R for samples and rho for populations. This statistic ranges from negative one to positive one, which communicates information about both direction and strength. Now the sign, plus or minus, tells us about the direction of the relationship. Um, or in other words, as one variable goes up, the other one goes up would be a positive relationship. As one variable goes up, the other one goes down is a negative relationship. Now the absolute value between zero and one tells us about the strength of this relationship. What we're primarily interested in detecting with a correlation coefficient is the presence or absence of a linear relationship. That is, when the pattern in the scatter plot looks more or less like a straight line, as you can see here. However, some variables will demonstrate more complex relationships, such as a curvilinear relationship, like the one seen here. So you can see this parabolic function. When there is no uh, correlation, points will simply be spread out across the plot. No line, straight or otherwise, would represent a reasonable description of the trend in this data. In other words, it would be difficult to predict someone's income based on their shoe size. These two variables don't seem to be related to one another. Now, a positive linear correlation occurs when high scores on variable one tend to go with high scores on variable two, middles with middles, and lows with lows. A line to fit these data slopes upward from the left to right. So people who sleep more hours per night on average will be in a better mood on the next day. Now a negative linear correlation occurs when high scores on variable one tend to go with low scores on variable two or vice versa. Now a line to fit these data slopes downward from left to right. So for example, as boredom with relationship increases, so scores are getting higher here, satisfaction with a relationship decreases. You can see that the scores are going down as boredom goes up. So by the strength of the relationship between two variables, we essentially mean how close to linear is their relationship. The closer the relationship is to a straight line, the better able we are to make predictions about y based on x, using the formula for a straight line. Variables with stronger relationships, whether positive, positive or negative, are said to correlate with one another. When points in a scatter plot are very spread out, this indicates a weak or non-existent relationship between these two variables. In these cases, it would be very difficult to predict scores on variable y from variable x using a straight line or otherwise. In other words, these two variables are not correlated. Because a correlation coefficient accounts only for strength and direction, so strength in terms of the linearity of it and direction in terms of how, whether it's positive or negative, it isn't able to uh, indicate the existence of nonlinear relationships. 
so curvilinear relationships. Therefore, you should always explore the scatter plot before calculating and interpreting R. So from negative one, a perfect negative relationship to zero, no relationship to positive one, um, a positive relationship, a perfect positive relationship. That's how um, the correlation coefficient ranges. So here is a perfect negative relationship. Here is a no relationship scatter plot. And here's a perfect positive relationship. So keep in mind that both this one and this one are equally strong. They just have opposite direction. Now, if points are arranged perfectly on a straight line, I can predict y from x. So if I know that x equals 100, I can read up and see that y also equals 100. Um, so if you'd like to play a correlation game, you could go to this shiny app here. Um, and what you're doing is examining the scatter plot and taking a guess as to what the correlation coefficient R is. From negative one, a perfect negative relationship, to zero, no relationship, to positive one, a positive uh, perfect relationship. Now, to actually calculate the correlation coefficient, we need a way to define what counts as a high or low score. So to do so, we need to be able to compare scores across different um, scales and measurement formats. So the way to solve this um, comparing apples to oranges issue is to standardize score by turning them into z-scores. So we've done this before. Remember what a z-score represents. It's the number of standard deviations that score is from its own mean. Z-scores can be positive um, when standard deviations are higher than the mean or negative when the standard deviation is lower than the mean. The number of standard deviations is lower than the mean. Um, and here's the formula. Z equals a score minus its own mean divided by its own standard deviation. So multiplying a person's two Z scores, one from each of the variables measured, yields the cross product of Z scores. These cross products have useful properties that allow us to quantify the strength and direction of a relationship. Highs going with highs. Um, so two positive Z scores will be multiplied yielding a positive co uh, cross product. Lows going with lows, two negative z scores will be multiplied, yielding a positive cross product. And highs going with lows, one positive and one negative z score will be multiplied, yielding a negative cross product. Thus, summing the cross products across all participants in a study tells us how often each of these three possibilities, high with high, low with low, low with high, occurs. A larger number of high, high, and low, low combinations is indicative of a positive correlation and will yield a larger, in absolute value, positive number. A larger number of low-high combinations, indicative of a negative correlation, will yield a larger, in absolute value, negative number. Now, if the above two possibilities occur in closer to equal proportions, indicative of no correlation, they will end up canceling each other out and yielding a closer value to zero. Dividing this sum by n, the sample size, would then give us an idea of the average cross product of z-scores. This number's absolute value would indicate the strength of the relationship and the sign, whether it's positive or negative, would indicate the direction of the relationship. Does this sound familiar? So this average standardized cross product is equivalent to r, the correlation coefficient. So the sum of the cross products of the z-scores divided by n, the sample size. So calculating r requires that we first convert scores on the two variables into z-scores. So x minus m uh, min divided by standard deviation of x, y minus my divided by the standard deviation of y. Then you multiply these two z-scores for each participant getting the cross products of the z-scores. You add up all the cross products 
and then divide the sum by the number of participants, yielding your correlation coefficient r. So open up the temp scale spreadsheet from Blackboard, temp sales, sorry, um, or canvas. And this spreadsheet contains three variables from a random selection of n equals 19 days throughout the year. And the variables are the average temperature on that day, the number, uh, the dollars uh, uh, in sales on ice cream at a small grocery store, and the dollars in sales on soup at that same store. So using the formula we just learned, let's calculate R for two variables we'd expect to be positively correlated, temperature and ice cream sales. And then we'll also calculate the correlation between temperature and soup sales, which we might expect to be negatively correlated. So to quickly get the sample standard deviation for z-scores, we'll start using the formula um, equals stdev.p, open parentheses. So let's move over to Excel. So let's start out by getting our averages for each of these three variables. So the mean of temperature, x, equals average A2 through A20. And we could just carry that on over here. Should be average of B2 through B20, average of C2 through C20. Now let's get those standard deviations using stdev.p, open parentheses, A2 through A20. And there's our standard deviation for x. Now let's drag that across to get that for the next two. Now let's calculate our z-scores. Equals the score, so a2, minus the mean a, to your number sign here, 23, divided by a, sorry, dollar sign, 25. So if we drag this across, we should get the same for ice cream and soup. And if we drag this down, we'll get our z-scores. Drag this down, we'll get our z-scores for ice cream. Drag this down, we'll get our z-scores for soup sales. Now right here, let's multiply the z-score for each temperature score um, and the z-score for each ice cream score by each other. So equals E2 asterisk times F2. And that's our cross product. Let's pull that on down. Now let's do the same for soup sales by temperature. So equals E2 times G2. Here's our cross product for temperature and soup. So remember, we want to take the average of these cross products to get our R, or our correlation coefficient. So in this I23 column equals average I2 through I20. And if we pull that over here, we should get the average of these, J2 through J20. So that's how you calculate a correlation coefficient, or two of them in this case. The correlation between temperature and ice cream sales, and the correlation between temperature and soup sales. Now let's move back over to PowerPoint. So what do the scatter plots look like for the two examples? Here is temperature and ice cream sales, 
we have an R of 0.88, indicating a positive relationship and a strong one because it's close to one between temperature and ice cream sales. As temperature increases, so do ice cream sales in dollars. Now, the relationship between temperature and soup sales is also fairly large, slightly smaller, but it's negative. So as temperature goes up, soup sales go down. So that's um, all I have in the PowerPoint for this week, but I just briefly want to go over how to do this in Jamovi. So here we are over in Jamovi, and I have this set up the same way as the Excel spreadsheet, because that's all we need to do to calculate correlation in Jamovi. So you have your three variables, and let's click on analyses. Go to regression and correlation matrix. So let's look at the correlation between temperature and ice cream sales. So, so we select two of these, this and this, move it over into this box. Now let's also request the correlation matrix and statistics. And it returns this here. So we see that ice cream and temperature are correlated at a Pearson's R of 0.88 as we found by hand, and it also gives you a p-value for this correlation. We'll talk about that later, and it is uh, significant. And then down here, we get our scatter plot, looking at sales in this column, and temperature here. Now, let's look at the correlation between temperature and soup scale uh, sales. Go to correlation matrix, enter temperature, enter soup, request that correlation matrix. And here's what we find. The correlation coefficient is negative 0.55, exactly what we found earlier. It is significant. And here it is plotted in a scatter plot. And you see that negative relationship. As temperature goes up, soup sales go down. So that's all I have for this week. Remember to keep an eye out for the homework and the quiz. And have a great rest of your week.